So today, of course, we continue our look at um, the dream of Scipio. And um, I've spoken to a few students, and some of you said that you're having a little bit of trouble following some of the storyline. So it's, it's, it's really actually quite simple. Like, don't, don't, be, don't worry too much about some of the, like there are many references to paintings and historical events and other things in here. Don't be too sidetracked by those things, right? Don't feel overwhelmed by them. You don't have to understand every little clue that is given to us by Ian Pears, right? Just follow the narrative, follow the relationships between the characters because they are the most important things for us to understand. Right? So, of course, we will be talking about many of those references. We will be talking about many of those clues and so on that Ian Pez gives to us. But in following the story, remember I said to you, just follow those three threads, right? Julian, Olivier, and Manlius, right? And if you can follow those relationships and the relationships that they have with other people, right? So we can see, of course, you know, for example, Julian is developing his relationship with Julia. Right? We see the relationship between Manlius and Sophia that is developing before our eyes, right? and so on. There are various other friends and um, relations and acquaintances that we see um, are important to those three main characters. But as long as you can follow those, those three threads, right, you shouldn't have any trouble following what's happening in this novel. Nonetheless, I have done, done a quick breakdown of what happens in our um, our reading for today, just to make sure we all understand, we're all on the same page as to what is happening in the story so we can follow these, these three threads. Okay. By the way, I apologize, my, my, my voice, I had the flu the last week and a half, so I don't know how much voice I have left. <laughs> I'm meeting with one of my graduate students after this class, and then I have another class this afternoon, so I don't know how much voice I will have left by the end of the day. Okay. So, as I said, let's quickly go over what happens in our reading for today, just to make sure we all understand the, what's happening in the story. As it jumps back and forward between the three different characters. Right? So, when we open our reading for today, we see that um, Julian and Julia, right? and of course those two names are deliberately chosen as mirrors of each other, right? because they're the, the male version and the female version of the same name. right? deliberately chosen to be mirrors of each other. So Julianne and Julia, they're traveling together and they have a stop through on the way to Jerusalem and there's this moment where he sees Julia is absorbed in her painting and he feels like this would be the moment in which he could like ask, basically ask her to be his girlfriend. Right? And then he hesitates and he misses the moment and the moment passes and then he's like, oh, you know, for a long time after that, for years after that when they they go their separate ways for a while. He's like, ah, oh, that would have been the moment. And I missed it, right? I should have said something. I should have told her how I felt. And we would have been together. We wouldn't have had missed any time together. But he misses that moment when they're traveling. Right? Um, then we move to a section in which we see two different sets of travels. Right? We see um, Ian Pears comparing the different kinds of experiences of travel that his characters have, because of course, this is one of the things that separates the different time periods, especially the more modern time period, right? For us, right, we measure travel in hours, don't we, right? So how many hours does it take to get to, let's say if we were tra traveling within Korea, how many hours would it take me to get to Daegu or to Busan or to Jeonju or any of those other cities, right? We wouldn't measure it in how many kilometers, how many hours would it take me to get there. But if you were doing this in, say, the medieval times, like Olivier is, would it be a matter of hours, even within Korea? It wouldn't, would it, right? So you would have to measure that in a different kind of way of looking at both what is around you and also how you think about time, right? So because of our modern ways of traveling have mean, mean that everything is so relatively close, right? So I can, I can leave Seoul and I can be on the other, other side of the world in less than one day, right? In just a few hours, right? Because that time, our world has been so compressed in terms of distance, right? We experience time differently, therefore. 
and we see that like what would be a short, very short journey for someone like Julian, he'd just get in a car or ride a bicycle or ride a motorbike or take a train, right? Any of those things would get him to where Olivier is going very quickly. It takes Olivier just for a short journey, it takes him two full days. So there's these different experiences that the, the characters have, and so um, each of them, um, but particularly Olivier, focuses upon his, uh, his, uh, his journey to the chapel of Saint Sophia. Right, and we're gonna see, talk today about why that's significant, what's the significance of this, this chapel. Right, then we jump back to the manliest story. Right, so we've gone from Julian's story to Olivier's story, back to Manlius. Manlius's story, we see that, um, you know, the, remember the, the empire is increasingly having troubles, right? Keeping order, barbarian invasions, you know, political corruption, all sorts of problems within the, within the, uh, in, within the empire. And so in the big city of, big southern city of Marseille, it's like the second biggest city in France, right? Down, right down in the south in the Mediterranean. Um, and that's where Sophia, remember, she was living there, right? And she was a teacher there. Remember, Manlius goes to Marseille for his own education, right? Um, but Marseille becomes increasingly dangerous. And so, remember, we saw last time that Manlius had wanted to give some kind of gift to Sophia. Remember, he tries to give her gold, he tries to give her love, right? And she refuses him. But now, with her life in danger, she said, all right, fine. You know, you can rescue me this time, right? And so he takes her away to one of his houses in Vaison, a small town right nearby where he is, right? So in that part. Okay, now at the end of that section, we learn that later on, much later in, this, in, in the story, after Manlius is dead, right, um, he is succeeded by just a... a very minor character in the story, but who nonetheless plays a pivotal part. And this is about the only time that he's actually mentioned is this one paragraph called Audric. And he is a barbarian, and he doesn't have any um, respect for learning, right? He doesn't care about learning. He doesn't want to learn about Sophia's philosophy. He doesn't care about any of the stuff that she cares about. But nonetheless, he does respect her as a person, right? And he has sort of a a, they have a respect for each other. They kind of like each other, even though they come from such different worlds. And so when Sophia dies, this guy, Audric, he builds a memorial to her, right? And in the local area, stories start to spring up. Myths, stories, legends about who Sophia was, right? So because of this guy, Audric, he just builds them, like he's, he does it not as a Christian thing, but just as a, as a memorial to Sophia. She was sort of, sort of his, begrudgingly his friend. And then these stories grow up around it. Now, remember, Olivier is living some 800 years or so after Manlius, right? About 850 years later. And um, so he writes to the cardinal that he works for, Chichani, right? And he tells him about the stories that he hears from the local people, right? And he, he, he tells the cardinal, oh yeah, this is the story of how this chapel dedicated to Saint Sophia, how like it came about, this is the myth about how it was founded, right? And as a result of this, Chichani decides, remember we saw that this was a crucial part of the culture of the medieval times and the Renaissance, he decides to patronize, remember this is what rich people and privileged people did to artists, was that they would say, all right, I'm gonna give you money and I want you to you know, paint me a chapel or paint me a picture or whatever, right? Write, write me a piece of music. So he decides to um, patronize this guy, Luca Pisano, right? And remember, he is um, Olivier's friend, right? Olivier's uh, close, close friend. And is he, Remember, Olivier is from what country? Where is all of this being set? France, right? He's French. Olivier de Noyer is a French name. Is Luca Pisano? It's not. Where is he from? He's Italian. And particularly, he's from a, a city called Siena, right? We'll see also why that is important in a moment. 
So Cicciani, remember he's the, the Italian cardinal, very powerful man who is the patron of Olivier, decides also to patronize Luca Pisano. And he hires him to paint, a, um, paint the walls right, of the, this chapel of St. Sophia. And then we get a section in which we see the, the actual, like the section of the letter from Olivier to Cicciani describing the myth about Saint Sophia, right? And how she came from, you know, after the death of Christ and came from Israel to, to, um, to, to southern France and, and did all these miracles and then, um, uh, and then founded this chapel, right? Quotes from Olivia's letter. Right. Now, we see, remember, at this time, Julian is living not in France, but where? Where is he living? He moved there in our last reading to Rome, right? Remember, he has a temporary position doing research in Rome for three years. Right. Um, and Julian, as he's doing his research, he starts to become aware of some of these connections, right, between St. Sophia and Olivier and all these things, but he doesn't pay much attention to it, right, because he's spending most of his time, remember, he missed his moment with Julia, with his real love, right, and so he dives headlong into a series of, like, love affairs that don't really go anywhere, right, he's sort of, you know, he's sleeping with all these women, but he's not really connected, he's not really looking for a connection. We also see that Julian, when he was in a soldier in World War I, he killed a man, right, in, in battle, right, so he stabbed him with his bayonet, right, you don't ever know what a bayonet is, right, sort of like a, like a rifle stick with a, um, a, a knife on the end, right, and usually you can, you can fire them as well, but if you, if you run out of bullets or if it takes too long, you can use the knife at the end to stab people. So he has dreams and he, he has nightmares and so on about having killed this soldier in World War I. And for him, it's not just about having killed someone, right? It's that he feels like killing someone was a betrayal of not just of like his values, but of the whole of civilization, right? It's, it's like civilized people don't go around killing people, right? And so he feels like very guilty for this. He feels like he betrayed civilization. Right, the very principle that makes him a civilized human being by doing this. Um, we also see that he then gets together with um, Claude Bronson, who is Julia's father, and they have um, a number of very important conversations in the first half of this book. Um, and in this part, they, they have a debate about the importance of civilization and how um, it's got to be protected and how it's always in danger of being corrupted it's always in danger of, like you know, bad people taking over, um, of of people being too complacent about the good times, right, and not protecting civilization enough. So, both Julian and Claude, even though they seem to be at odds sometimes on this, they ultimately seem to agree that civilization is something that needs to be protected. Now, we then move to a section where the narrator begins by comparing different relationships of different ages between the characters, right? So we remember Claude Bronson is much older than Julian, right? Julian's a young man, he's an older man, right? He's the same age as Julian's father, we assume, right? And so we see that Julian and Claude, even though they have a fairly close relationship, they say, well, you know, there's still there still is some distance between them because of their difference in age, right? And then he compares this to other ages, right? He says, Olivier and Chichani, are they gonna be good friends? No, right? Not only because of the age difference between them, but also because of the difference in power, right? No one, no, no one is gonna become friends with their boss in that kind of context, right? It's too dangerous, too much power, too much distance between them. And then we see a curious one here between Manlius and his adopted son, Syagrius, right? And Syagrius, I, I feel very sorry for him because he, he gets the, the, the wrong end of the stick all the way through this novel. 
Um, and, uh, his, and what we see here is that like when, when, when we are in a family, in a modern family today, what are our expectations about the relationships between um, parents and children? How do they relate to each other? What is, what is the main motivation for parents and children relating? What is the main motivation that we're, at least that we're supposed to have? Love, right? right? So you're supposed to love your parents. Doesn't always happen. Right? Parents are supposed to love their children. And this is supposed to be a bond right? that we take as the normal way of relating between parents and children in our age. Right? But what Ian Pears shows us is that other ages, right, other times, other historical periods can have very different conceptions of what a family means, right? Of what a relationship in this case between a father and son, even though he's an adopted son, right, can be. And in this case, we see that actually, in Manlius's time, it is not normal to have a relationship between parents and children based upon love, but one rather based upon authority, right? I am your father, do what I tell you, right? So it's almost more like a, um, a, a boss-employee relationship, one of duty and employment, than it is of love. Right? So these, and of course, Ian Pears is not just making, like this, he's not just making Manlius up to be like this horrible, bad father figure. He's just reflecting the values and the ways in which people think in his time. Right? He's a normal father. Right? Just like when we see Olivier and his father, Right? And his father also treats Olivia, all right, I am your father, you will become a lawyer. Because right? that's what I want you to do. And we see Olivia and his father also ha don't have a love relationship either, do they? Right? So there are these different models, different ideas about family as well that characterize each different time period, right? that reflect the way in which people thought at those times. So poor old, uh, Manlius, we see that he has tried a number of times to have children. His wife has had miscarriages. She has failed to produce an heir. And so he eventually adopted a son, Syagrius, right, which also is meant to kind of reflect his, um, his fascination with Roman culture too because this is a, this is a, a strategy that a lot of the um, aristocratic Romans, particularly of emperors, Right, so Julius Caesar, when he, uh, when he died, right, his son, Augustus, wasn't actually his son. It was, he was actually an adopted son. Right? He was part of the extended family, but he adopted him as his son. Similarly, in the tale that we have at the center of our story, right, when we have uh, the two Scipios, remember in the dream of Scipio, there are the two, there's the younger Scipio and there's the grandfather Scipio Africanus. They're actually not related, right? They have the same name, they inherit the same name, but they are adopted into the family, right? So this uh, idea of adoption is, is a, a, a long-standing Roman one. Um, and Manlius, he, um, he tries to have children, but he can't. He's unable to, and so he adopts this young man, Syagrius, and um, he chooses Syagrius on the basis that this guy looks, he's a handsome young man, right? He looks, he looks uh, very handsome, and so he thinks, oh, well, he's handsome. He must be smart as well. It turns out, no, not that smart, not that intelligent, and Manlius is very disappointed. Then at the end of that section, we see Manlius and Sophia have a long philosophical, well not long, but in terms of their time, it's, a, it's a, a long debate about the topic of love in which they bring in all sorts of other famous authors to talk about this idea. And then at the very end of that section, we have a very interesting question that Manlius leaves, leaves hanging, is can, excuse me, can virtue survive the nasty business of politics, right? Is it possible to do something bad for the sake of doing something good, right? 
So this is a, a classic ethical kind of dilemma, right? So like, you know, the, the, the most famous one is like, if you, if you could go back in time, would you kill Hitler to save all the people who died in World War II, right? Is it okay to kill one person to save all those millions, right? So that's the a, that's a kind of um, dilemma he's facing. Um, so Julia, we, we see, also learns about the Chapel of St. Sophia, and she goes and she studies the paintings that Pisano had left there, and she's influenced by them. And where we close off, we see Julia is trying to become a good painter, right? And she knows that she has ability. She knows that she has the talent to be a great painter, but she feels like there's something emotionally missing, right? She's not, she's like she hasn't found her, her voice, as it were, as a painter yet. Right, she hasn't found her style. Um, and so part of her, her sort of her mindset that she has trouble with is that she, we see that Claude Brunson is a very loving, kind sort of father, but Julia constantly feels smothered by him. And so as a kind of rebellion, she marries this guy, this other guy. And he's a nice guy, she likes him, but she doesn't feel in love with him. And so eventually she sells him, look, Sorry, I have to divorce you. And that's, this leads her to reconnect with Julian. And that's where we leave off today. Right, so is everyone clear on what, what is happening in our story to this point? Right? So this, these are the, the basic parts of the story. Okay. So one of the things I want, well, the, the thing I want to focus on today in terms of our themes is that of the way in which History changes the way in which we understand things. Right? We've, already we've already talked so far about like, the different ways in which parents relate to their children, or the elder relate to younger in terms of friendship. Right? So Claude Bronson and Julian, for example, Chichani and uh, Olivier. Right? Um, so there are a number of different ways in which this happens, that there are these historical misunderstandings that keep happening throughout the novel that between the different characters, between um, uh, the different histories, the different time periods that allow for mistakes, under misunderstandings, these kinds of problems to arise. Right? So there are a number of different reasons for it. Sometimes we see that the evidence is gone, the evidence is missing. Right, so think about when we're first introduced to Olivier's story. We're told, well, the problem with trying to tell Olivier's story from the existing documents is that, well, most of his poems were destroyed, most of his works were destroyed, most of the things that we know about him were destroyed, and so only, we only just have sort of fragments left of his life. Right? So the story that we're seeing unfolding about Olivier in The Dream of Scipio Right, is our privileged insight into seeing behind the, thi the things that really happened. Right? Okay. Sometimes, and we see this again also with the Olivier story, sometimes stories get rewritten right, according to the things that we think might have happened right? or how we want things to happen. So we saw that the, the story of Olivier is overwritten by like the, the life story of someone like Petrarch, right, the Italian poet. And they're like, oh, well, you know, Olivier is kind of like Petrarch, so like, why wouldn't we have the same thing happen to him as what happened to Petrarch? Right? And then, then um, the narrator goes on to tell us how like, the same story gets recycled for other famous people as well. Right? And then lastly, sometimes we project our own ideas and our own prejudices, sometimes consciously but mostly unconsciously back onto the past. We misunderstand or we misread or we don't know enough about history to understand what is happening and we, we read the past in our own terms rather than on the values of what that time actually believed or what it actually thought. So I want to actually begin today with an example of painting. Because we've now been introduced to the character of Luca Pisano, who is Olivier's 
friend from Siena, the Italian painter. Okay. And of course, we're seeing, as we've talked about, um, touched on briefly before, we're seeing that this story of Olivier's is set at the very beginning of a period known as what? Not the Middle Ages anymore. We're moving into what? What comes after the Middle Ages? French word meaning rebirth. The Renaissance, yes. Okay. So remember, we talked about this particularly with regard to Petrarch. Petrarch is seen as amongst the poets and seen as the first Renaissance poet, right? So Olivier, Petrarch, they're being portrayed, of course Olivier doesn't really exist, but they're being portrayed to us in the novel as the first Renaissance kind of painters. And what we're seeing here as well with Luca Pisano is that he also is fictional, but he's being presented to us here and is modeled upon the early Renaissance painters. Now, one of the things that um, we start to see in Pisano's painting, and it's talked about, and it's talked about briefly in our reading today too, is that he starts to paint in a more realistic style than previous painters had done. Okay. So, I've given you an example here. This is this is um, early 14th century, early 1300s. Okay. Does this painting look realistic? What's unrealistic about it? Particularly the size, right? This is, this is one of the things about medieval painting that is quite different, right? Why do you think, I mean, look at, like, look at this guy, right? He's a full-grown man, right? Who is this? And how old is Jesus here? Oh, look at how he's dressed. He's still a baby, yeah, right? So look at the size of this baby. <laughs> and then, like, he's almost the size of a full-grown man, right? And then, who is this? Virgin Mary, right? And look at, she's, you know, twice the size, giant of a woman, right? Why are they painted this way? Why, why are they made so big? What is, it, what is the paint? Like, it's not that the painter couldn't see. They were like, oh no, oh no, I've made the Virgin Mary really big and look at this, oh, what have I done, right? This is not a mistake. Why do you think they did this? What does it do when we look at this painting and we see these two giant figures in the middle? What does it tell us about them? Right? He wants to emphasize those two people, and it's also meant to be about how important they are, right? Is it, like, not only does it make them, like, the centerpiece of the picture, right? So we have all these other smaller people, even though proportionally they're, they're meant to be larger, right? But also that these are meant to be, like, the big, historical, important religious figures. And you notice, too, that they also have halos, which is meant to be a sign of their, um, you know, their divinity, right? their saintliness as well. Right, so you can see that like the, the way in which the medieval painters, right, the, one, of, one of the other things you notice about this portrait, or this, this picture rather, is that it's very flat, isn't it? Right, just very two dimensional, right? We don't get really a sense of, people being behind each other in any real sort of sense. They're just sort of flat figures on a flat background, right? So these are all things that start to change during the Renaissance, right? Is that we get a greater sense of realism and we also start to see the use by, um, by painters of what's known as perspective, right? So that things that are closer, they look closer, right? They're made to look closer. Things that are further away are made to look further away and it's meant to be in proportion to each other. So if we look at some early uh, uh, painters of the Renaissance, they're still, and, you know, because this is not, not that much long after the, the previous picture, but this is pro probably one of the models for Luca Pisano, although he's a Florentine painter rather than a, 
uh, Sienese painter, um, is a guy called Giotto, who's seen as one of the, the first of the Renaissance painters. Right? And what do we see about this picture of, well, who, are the, who's, who, who do we have here in this, this picture? Who, who's here on the left? Same as the last picture. Virgin Mary. This is baby Jesus and his father, Joseph. Right? So this is meant to be the, the holy family, right? Okay. What do you notice about their proportions? Is baby Jesus giant baby Jesus? Not anymore, is it? Right? It, still has the, it still has the halo, right? but right, you can see that the proportions are, st are starting to change. Right? And we also start to get a little bit of sense of, of perspective. So this is, compared to the last picture, this still doesn't look particularly realistic. But compared to the last picture, we're starting to see more reality, more realism being brought into the picture. So here's a, a bigger scene of a similar kind of scene. This is from um, the, the last of the detail you can see from over here. Right? So we have here, this is the whole picture of the nativity. Right? Still not entirely realistic, but now we start to see, oh, actually, I was wrong. This, this is the Virgin Mary here. This is, I don't know who she is. She's just some random woman. Um, and this is meant to be Joseph. Um, so, we can start to see that there's more of a sense of perspective, right? but still not entirely realistic. Right? But things are changing in this time. Okay. Um, and I, I chose this, this, this guy too, because he, there's a, a whole school of, of style of painting that comes out of the Renaissance um, at this time, and particularly out of the same city that Luca Pisano is from, Siena, right, in Italy. So this guy um, and his brother, um, the Lorenzetti brothers, they are um, also developing a more realistic style. And you can look at the, look at the, uh, the, um, the figures in this painting, even though, again, they have the halos, right, nonetheless, they have like a more realistic kind of anatomy to them. There's meant to be a greater sense of realism, right? More sense of them being human rather than divine, okay? So, um, so yes, this, this guy you can see here dies in 1348. What happened in 1348? What was our major event that happens in that time period? The Black Death. Right, and so yes, he died from the Black Death, as did his brother, right, in that same year. Right? So, very common death date, which you'll see is 1348 because of that. Okay, so as it says there, when we look at when we look at these paintings with our eyes, like we are used to seeing photographs, right? We are used to seeing painters who can paint in a much more realistic sort of way if they want to, right? In fact, we live in, a, we live in an age where modern art has gone long past realistic painting, right? And has done all sorts of abstract and all sorts of other conceptual stuff. Um, but at the same time, when we look back at history, we can see that there is a, a developing pattern here, right? That we can start to see that there's more realism that is gradually coming into these paintings and that this develops in various ways. Right? This changes the way in which people start to look at the world. Right? Now, the significance of this has to do with not just like the way in which a picture looks, right? but it has to do with the way in which also it changes the way in which we think about the world. Right? So if you think back to like the first picture that we saw, right, where we had the giant Virgin Mary, giant baby Jesus. Right? The idea was that these figures were larger than life. They were supernatural. They were, this was like how you were supposed to view them in a painting because this was the, the perspective that you gave them 
in terms of their importance in your world philosophy, in your world view. Right? It emphasized the divine, their godlike aspect. Right? But what happens as the Renaissance goes on is that not only do people, not only do painters start painting more realistically, but their realism reflects a focus away from religion, away from the divine, to painting, even, even if they're still painting religious scenes, they're now painting them as human. Not divine, not godlike, right? So, a, I didn't put it up here, but there's a very famous painting by Hans Holbein from the 16th century, from the 1500s, in which he shows the Christ after he's just come off the cross, and he's you know, this dead body. Very realistic. It looks very disturbing. Right? Um, and it's disturbing. Not only from the sense of like seeing a dead body is disturbing, but also because it's meant to be religiously disturbing in the sense that here is this real human body. Right? It gives us this sense of like Christ no longer being like this supernatural, you know, superhuman giant being, but instead of just being like everyone like us. Right? So there's a kind of um, a movement away from religion, a movement away from um, those ideas of the divine to the ideas of the human that is reflected in the way in which these painters are painting and thinking. So these different ways of reading history and understanding the past are things that um, Ian Pears, he shows us this doesn't happen just in art, because remember I told you that Ian Pears began his, his sort of his um, adult life as an art historian, so he knows a lot about art. Um, but he shows them in all sorts of other ways that there are different ways of misreading and misunderstanding the past. So, for example, he looks at the way in which when, they, when they're traveling, the, um, the three characters, Julien, Olivier, and Manlius, each have different ways of looking at the nature that they see around them, right? So when Manlius is traveling, he has a different way of looking around him. He reads it through Virgil. Right, let's read this quote for you. Certainly, Olivier saw the world in a novel and strange fashion. Manlius contemplated the landscape and forced it into the conventions of the Virgilian eclog, right, making it a confirmation of a literary tradition that was by, this, by his time almost dead and imbuing it with a melancholy of a nostalgic futility. Let me explain that. Anyone heard of the Roman poet Virgil. Anyone? Heard of him, Virgil? Okay. Well, in the, um, the Greek tradition, we of course have Homer, right? He was a famous epic poet, right? So Homer wrote the Iliad about you know, a, a fight at, um, between Achilles and the rest of the Greek army. Um, over a girl at the, during the Trojan War, and then the Odyssey, which tells the story of Odysseus coming home from the Trojan War. Now, in the first century BC, the Roman poet Virgil wanted to emulate Homer, and so he wrote a famous epic poem called the Aeneid. Right? And the Aeneid tells because we have, from Homer, we have the perspective of the Greeks, right? The Aeneid tells the story from the perspective of a Trojan prince, right? Called Aeneas. That's why it's called the Aeneid. Right? And his adventures after the fall of, of Troy, okay? Now, that was, that's Virgil's most famous work. But Virgil also wrote some other kinds of poems. And one set of poems that he wrote was called the... So this is the kind of poem that, um, that uh, Manlius is thinking of. This set of, short, just a short little book of poems called the Eclogues, and they are about 
sort of glorifying what it's like to live in the country, right? To li and not to not being a farmer or anything like that, because you, know, you know, Virgil was upper class, right? So it's like what how nice it is to live on your country estate, right? And glorifying the sort of a pastoral country style life outside of the rat race of the city, right? Outside of the politics of Rome, right? To live on your country estate. So when Manlius travels through the countryside, how is he seeing it? Well, he's read these poems by Virgil about, oh, the pleasures of country life, right? And he's thinking, oh, yeah, oh, it's just like Virgil described, except, oh, now it's not like Virgil described because now there's barbarians and there's danger and, you know, it's not a be this beautiful country life. And, oh, I wish it was like Virgil's days, right? Is how he is thinking of it, right? So he's, he is viewing it through his tradition, his Roman tradition, right? He's viewing nature through the poems that he's read, the Roman poems that he's read. He's reading them through, like Virgil, and he's wishing that those days would come back. He's wishing that he could be back in those times. But unfortunately for him, that's not how it is anymore. Now we see, by contrast, we have the more modern character of Julian, right? And he is not reading, he's not understanding the countryside through Virgil, even though he's probably read Virgil, but instead with a more modern thinker. So Julian responded with all the orthodoxy of a man brought up on Rousseau. Right? Okay. So Rousseau is. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, okay. and Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a famous Swiss philosopher in Geneva, so he spoke French, so he's also well, very well known in, in France, remembering that Julien is French, um, although Rousseau's ideas have been so popular that they really have influenced the whole of the modern world. And he was, um, he was writing and living in the 18th century, in the 1700s. Okay? And against the ideas of the Enlightenment, Rousseau put forward the idea, actually, you know, civilization has made us corrupt, it's made us weak, right? It's led to all sorts of vices, right? He says, like, compare what life is like in a big city like Paris. He's like, oh, there's gambling, and there's vice, and there's prostitution, and there's crime, and, like, it's dirty, and... You know, there's, there's lots of disease, right? And he says, now compare that to the countryside. There's no prostitutes. There's no gambling. There's no petty crime. Oh, it's clean and beautiful and lovely. Oh, so we should return to nature, right, is Rousseau's argument, okay? So Rousseau has strongly, strongly influenced many of the ideas today, right? He's seen as the founder of the, the Romantic movement, the, the goes through the 18th and the 19th century, but also still through influencing many other ideas that are still prevalent today, like you know, environmentalism, for example, owes a lot to Rousseau. Okay. So we see here like that what Ian Pears gets us to think about is the way in which these characters, they're influenced by the books that they've read, the culture that's around them, the things that they've seen, right, that influence their time period. Are trees and flowers and grass or it, mountains or rivers, are they any different today than they were in Manlius's time? They still look pretty much the same, don't they? Right? They still have leaves and they still have you know, petals and they still have water flowing through the rivers and so on. They all look the same, but the way in which we relate to them as human beings changes according to the ideas of our time. Right? So, Manlius' time, he looks at them through the poems that he's read by Virgil. Julian's time, he looks at them through the ideas of Rousseau. Right? Olivier, well, he's, he has a bit more sort of a happy-go-lucky, right? Wait, it says, Olivier's response was more wayward and indeed more original, for he felt that he was tasting a private, personal pleasure. The fact that no one else could or wanted to share his delight was the essence of his happiness. So Olivier... He doesn't read it through any particular 
poet or philosopher or a thinker, he is he feels like he's reading it in his own way. Okay, so these influences, these his historical influences, if we're going to understand the characters, we have to realize that they are influenced by things that we are not influenced by, right? We don't go out there and see the springtime through the eyes of Virgil, right? Well, I'd be very surprised if you did, right? So I don't see like Numhead going, ah, oh, these trees remind me of you know, eclogue number three by Virgil. No, right? No? No, I didn't think so, right? Um, but, but nonetheless, we should all realize that when we do look out at nature, when we do look at our world, when we, whatever it is that we're looking at, whether it's paintings or you know, nature or whatever, other human beings, that we are influenced by certain ideas and values of our own time that can be very different to other times. So the most extreme example of misreading that we have in today's section is that of Sophia. Because we see that Sophia goes from being a, what she really was, which was a Neoplatonist philosopher, right, who we saw was at the same time as she uh, was, um, she didn't want her, her followers simply to be uncritically against Christianity, right, because remember she has a session where she's like, well, today we're going to talk about what's good about Christianity, right? So she doesn't want them just to not think about like the, the values of Christianity, but she is mostly critical of Christian ideas, right? And not, so not because they're, they're Christian ideas, but because she sees a lot of the people who are following Christianity, and not just the people, like anyone who is not really thinking, she has contempt for, right? Anyone who is not really using their brain to think through their ideas and think through their worldview, whether they're Christian or pagan, you know, because she's just as critical of Manlius, right? Even though he is also not Christian, right? She's very critical of him too, because she says, like, look, what the things you're saying to me, you haven't thought about them, right? Use your brain, think them through, and then we can come to some kind of conclusion. So we see that she gets kicked out, well, she, she not kicked out, but she, her life is in danger because she is seen by the, um, the inhabitants of Marseille as being pagan, right? As not being Christian like that. So she says to, to Manlius, do you know, they call me the pagan, these worthy citizens. They spotted in a day that I do not go to church and actually came to ask me why. I thought I might give some lectures here, but I might as well try to instruct a, a herd of goats. Okay, that's what she says. Right. So we see that, as, this, as we said, she's not anti-Christian as such, but she is critical of people who just accept these ideas that they're, they're given about Christianity without even thinking, thinking them through. And particularly, we can see, of course, that the, these, the attitude of these so-called Christians is not very Christian, is it? Right? They are putting her life in danger for not being a Christian when, remember, the, the teachings of Jesus are, you know, forgive your enemies, turn the other cheek, etc. So we see that this process of misunderstanding, of changing Sophia's uh, ideas or her reputation from being this rather radical Neoplatonic philosopher into being something else begins with the memorial built to her by Audric. Right, the successor to Manlius. So we see here, Audric built the little monument to her over her grave. Right, so Sophia dies, she's put it in the ground, Audric builds this monument to her. To remember someone to whom he had become quietly devoted. The story of his respect survived, the memory of her advice gathered miraculous overtones, and eventually a small chapel grew around her tomb as people came to pray there for help. Right. So she goes from being this philosopher and then gradually people like, misunderstand. They think, oh, maybe she was a saint. Maybe she had these powers. Maybe she could do these things. Maybe she was a saint, really. 
right? And then we get the full version in Olivier's letter. Right? So turn with me, if you will, to that, that page. Uh, page uh, 43 in the, in the booklet. So on that part that begins a, a few years, about two-thirds of the way down. So let's read together the, um, the part of the letter that Olivier sends to uh, Cicciani that tells us the, the myth of Saint Sophia, right? So this is, this is remember, we've, we've seen the real Sophia. This is the myth about her that's been created. A few years after the crucifixion of our Lord, he began, when men were beginning to embrace his teaching, right, so a few years after the crucifixion of Jesus, the priests became angry and fearful and started persecuting the faithful. Mary Magdalene, who is Mary Magdalene? Who is she? She was a, a former prostitute that was converted by Jesus, right, and so she because of his teaching, she became one of his followers, right? And she's particularly famous because she was the first person to see Jesus after he was resurrected from the dead, right? So Mary Magdalene, so privileged that she was the first to hear of Christ's resurrection, was hounded and spat on, as were the group of women she had gathered around her. A plot was hatched to kill them all, but an angel came to her in her sleep and warned her. Rise up, Mary, the angel said, and leave quickly. Gather your friends and depart. Mary did as she was told, gathering half a dozen companions and went to the shore. Waiting for them was a miraculous boat, empty of sailors, its sails of silk and its hull of pearl. The moment they got in, the sails unfurled and the boat slipped into the water just as their enemies ran up to stop them. The voyage lasted weeks, but no one was afraid. It's quite a miracle, huh? Um, but no one was afraid. When it rained, they did not get wet. Wow. When there was a storm, the boat hardly rocked. Scarcely rocked. Angels brought them food and water every day and kept them cool in the sun by carrying a great silken awning over them. It's quite an amazing journey. When the time came, the boat turned inshore, even though the wind was blowing strongly in the opposite direction. Wow. And came to rest on the beach of a strange land. Again, an angel spoke to Mary and said they were to travel throughout the land and tell everyone of Christ's coming. But some were afraid and refused to leave Mary's side, knowing that she was beloved. Only Sophia obeyed, bidding farewell to Mary and converting town after town so that everywhere she went became Christian, tearing down temples and building churches in their place. Many miracles attended her. On one occasion, a great nobleman called Manlius, who had been blind for many years, came to her. You say God is love and cares for all his creation, yet I am blind, he said. How can that be? Sophia took him to one side and instructed him, and passed her hand over his eyes, and instantly his sight was restored. Wow. He fell at her feet in gratitude, and the crowd was so amazed they all did the same. This man spent the rest of his life preaching and established himself at Vaison, converting the whole area around. He, too, became a saint. One day, when Sophia was preaching in the town, the people incited by the priests began to shout and threaten her. They took her to jail and sentenced her to death. But her work was not yet done, and an angel appeared to the man she had cured and told him of her plight. Straight away he was transported to the spot, like magic, right? Just transported to the spot and held up his arms. The guards all fell asleep, and the jails, jail doors opened. He then escorted her away from the town, and they walked until they came to a hill. When she died, she was buried there, and so many wonderful things happened at her grave that all realized she was a saint. So they built a chapel and came on pilgrimage. All right. So this is the myth that has grown up around Sophia, transforming her from 
the Sophia, the Sophia that we've seen, right? The real Sophia, the Neoplatonist philosopher, into this miracle worker, Saint Sophia, who came on a magical boat from Israel to, to, to France, or somewhere near France, and then went out and preached the word of God and changed many lives and came across a blind man called, was Manlius blind? No. But he came across a blind man, Manlius cured him, turned him into a saint. Right? So all of this stuff we see has little bits of truth in it, doesn't it? Right? Little bits of reality. So we do see that Man she does meet a guy named Manlius. He does rescue her. Right? But these aren't the circumstances in which they happen. But this whole myth is built up around Sophia, transforming her into almost the exact opposite of what she was, right? in the most ironic sort of way. Of course, in a way that she would not have even known, <laughs> understood, or, or approved of. Right? So these kinds of misunderstandings, as I said, we see them happening throughout the novel, but we also, also should be aware of them as we are reading too, right? Is that one of the, one of the things that Ian Pears plays with all the way through is the way in which there is a big difference between the way we see the world, between the way certainly Manlius sees the world, between the way Olivier sees the world, and of course we are much closer to Julian, right? Although even there, given that, you know, he's, he, you know, in terms of the distance between now and when he died is about 70 years. You know? So there's still, you know, still quite a difference there too. So um, there are these historical misunderstandings. We live in different times and even though the things that we see around us might seem to be the same, even though like, all these stories in here, even though these three stories are all set in the same part of France, right? those different Historical times, the different cultural influences, different literary influences, different historical influences, they all change the way in which we see the world. Right? So this is a different take on the, a very similar idea that we saw in Atonement, which was that in that book, we saw that perspective changed things, but for the most part, those perspectives, except for the, the epilogue, right, the, the last part, set in 1999, were all in the same time period, right? So jumping from different perspective to different perspective in part one, we saw was in, already there were misunderstandings and misinterpretations that were going on. But now we see this expanded out into historical misunderstandings as well, right? That we can look at paintings, we can read works from the past, we can um, you know, look at, you know, histories and so on, and we can think that we can try to grasp them, we can try to get inside the minds of the past, but most of the time we are misreading and misunderstanding what is actually happening. Okay, so those of you who didn't get to go today, I'll get to you next time. All right, thank you guys. I'll see you on, on Monday.